wrote the rough draft. Yeah! What should you work on in the second draft? Cause that first draft, it is bad. Of course your rough draft is bad. That's why it's called rough. The next few drafts you're going to make smooth. Hi, I'm Autumn Bardot and here you will find quick tips, author tools, and hopefully even a little bit of inspiration. If you're new, welcome to my channel. And if you're a return subscriber, thank you so much. And if you've been watching but haven't hit that subscribe button, give it an old click and hit that notification button. It helps me get the content out there to everybody in the YouTube verse. As always, my notes are at Club Autumn. Link will be below. That is a Facebook group page. The second draft is hands down my very favorite draft to write. I think it's because I'm a glutton for punishment. It's my favorite part of the writing process. With the rough draft, I have the story and I know it works. Now I'm just going to take all that roughness and smooth it out. The rough draft is really the bones of my story and I'm going to include a link in the description box below of what my rough draft is and what it entails. But I consider it the skeleton. You know what I need to do now on the second draft, right? Mm-hmm. The second draft is where I get to pack on all that meaty deliciousness and more, all the good stuff. I make the characters come alive. That's the plan. I make their world real. I add detail, which, you know, I just might take out later. I hear their individual voices and I see them. I get a handle on their personality, their emotions, their needs, their desires, their weaknesses, and their strengths. This is where I put that all in. And that's where that lovely character chart comes in handy. And the character chart definitely helps you with that character arc that I'm a big fan of for a novel or any story. The links to those videos, they're in the description box as well. What did the character learn about themselves? Did they have an epiphany, an awakening? What life lesson did they learn? And what did they have to overcome? The second draft usually takes me anywhere from two to four months or five months. It really depends on the genre that I'm writing. If I'm writing historical fiction, it will take on the longer end of that spectrum. And my historical novels tend to be pretty meaty and usually come in at 450 words. I think a lot with the historical fiction is because I'm also working with a timeline and facts and historical data I need to get just right. Also, I don't write full time, so that's probably why it takes me so long. I move through this second draft very slowly. Here is where I also add a lot to my word count, a lot. And I also do a lot of things at once in my second draft. This way works for me. And as you've heard me say before, you really have to find what works best for you, what feels natural to you. It took me about mm, three novels before I figured out what I needed to do and not do in my second draft. The different draft stages for me and what worked and what didn't work where I could be most efficient and what was the best time-wise for me. And the second draft for me just naturally emerged into the stuff I'm going to be talking about in a few moments. First, we're going to start with what I don't worry about or concern myself with in a second draft, commas. Yeah, I'm not going to obsess over commas at this point. Yes, of course I use them. I use all the punctuation in my second draft, but I'm not going to obsess about, do I need a comma here or a comma there? And in fact, when we get to that video about commas, I'm going to tell you how many comma rewrites I did for Goddesses Inc. I don't concern myself with tiny word tweaks. There's time for that later. Sometimes a word or phrase or action that I used in the second draft doesn't resonate in the third and fourth. So I'm not going to sit there and ponder it because sometimes you just need to see the novel as a whole to see if it works as a whole. I also don't ponder on words I've used too often. Those are things I will go back and look at in subsequent drafts. So what am I concerned with? Well, I'm concerned with 
packing all of the parts onto that skeleton to make it flesh and blood and real. So we're going to go with the skeleton symbol here and we're going to discuss it in terms of, you know, how we're made. The blood vessels. What is the life force of the novel? Intrigue, romance, mystery, anger, action, adventure, mysticism, magic. What forces run through the character? Surreal, historical, fantastical, philosophical, 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 political. You get the point. What is going through and sustaining the novel? It can be several things. Ears. What do the characters listen to? Their heart, their mind, others, the world. And in terms of imagery, what do they hear in the environment? The sound of the surf pounding against the beach? Some kind of maybe background noise from going to a cafe? You always want to include sound imagery. After all, how often is it that you hear nothing in your house? Eyes. How do your characters see the world? What kind of lens are they looking through? Are they short-sighted or near-sighted in terms of their personality? Do they see life through rose-colored glasses? Do they have a jaded view of life? Every one of us has some kind of bias. What bias lens are your characters looking through? Is their lens smudged with experience? Foggy from the past? Grimy or dirty? because of the filth that they have encountered in the world? Are they far-seeing or short-sighted? In terms of imagery, what do your characters actually see? In the rough draft, I would write something like the mirror on the wall. In the second draft, I will add an adjective. Maybe it's a gilt-framed mirror. And I add the adjective not for adjective's sake or for word count, but to give some extra flavor, some extra nuance, some extra enrichment and depth to either the character or to the plot. For example, in Goddesses Inc, Axie stands in front of a full length framed mirror and regards herself and realizes how small she has become, not in actual height, but her smallness in the scope of how she feels in the world. She is struck by how very ungoddess she looks in this large gilt framed mirror. In another scene, in a smudges condensation from a bathroom mirror and sees the truth of her being made mortal. There's a lot you can do with imagery. What do they see? What's around? Sometimes it doesn't have to be long. In fact, it really shouldn't be long. Nobody likes to read long descriptions, but you can throw in a word or two to give it that flavor and that enrichment of either your setting or your characters. Brain. What are your characters smart at? What are they dumb? Or they lack experience or judgment about. We know the saying, why are you being so dumb? It's not about intelligence so much as it is what they're doing or what they're thinking. Nose. What do your characters have a nose for? Computers, drama, music, gossip. What are they good at? <laughs> Sniffing out. In terms of imagery, what does the setting smell like? Or what do they smell? Do they inhale the delicious aroma of fresh ground beans at the coffee shop? Do they inhale a salty sea air? Do they wrinkle their nose at something foul smelling? Don't forget smell in your imagery. The mouth. They're all important, but this is one of my favorites. What is your character's unique voice? Not just the sound of their voice. That's not really what I'm discussing, although that can be part of it. Dialogue reveals a lot. It can reveal gender, education, political affiliations, culture, education, region, dialect, profession, age, maturity, their personality, and emotion. Dialogue can reveal a lot. So it's not just the actual sound of their voice, if that's important. You know, are they squeaking or screaming or murmuring or purring? Hmm. 
also in terms of voice, do they have a voice in society? Do they have a voice with the other characters? Or is their voice maligned, misunderstood, disregard it and disrespect it? Does their voice matter? Does what they have to say matter? And in terms of imagery for the mouth, what do they taste? Does something sour in their mouth? Is something too sweet to be believable? Or does the sweetness gag them? The next is soul. And I know what you're thinking. You're saying the soul isn't like part of their actual body. You want to think about what fills their soul and what crushes their soul. Because I don't believe it's like heart. And here's why. I separate heart and soul because I see the soul as something more at odds sometimes with who we are and what we want. It's more ingrained in our very being. My heart may break, but my soul will know that I will continue on, that I will muster on, that I will heal. My character may be heartless, but her soul may yearn for love. The muscles. I don't think I have any, mm -mm. unless it's this one. It, the muscles for me are their needs and desires. What moves them? What propels them to keep moving forward, to keep overcoming in the novel? Think of muscles as strength to forge ahead and to overcome whatever it is they need to overcome for that great character arc ending. The fat. I definitely have some of that. For me, that's the character's personality quirks and ticks. I will always add these to my character chart as they arise organically from the rough draft and the second draft, the one we are discussing today. I never try to force character quirks or ticks on them. I just, as I'm writing that second draft and something emerges that goes with their personality and I realize, hey, that is something I can use or embed into the novel, then I will add it to the character chart. It's another identifier, the skin. Now that is just the outward appearance of your character. In some ways you can have your character's personality be aligned to what they look like or give character clues. For example, in Dragon Lady, some of the characters I used Chinese face mapping I think it's called, where somebody can look at your face and tell you what kind of personality you have. So I kind of did it backwards. I knew what personality they have and so I made them look like that. And I embedded that into the novel. So something like he had the high forehead of somebody who blah, 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 blah. And he had the close set eyes of a blah, 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 blah. I found it fun to do that. I wanted to create the link to the character's face. In terms of imagery, what does your character feel on their skin? Or what do they feel when they touch something? Warm sand between their toes, steam from a shower, cold water, the warm touch of a hand. Once again, sometimes all it takes is a quick little adjective, not for adjective's sake, but to give an indicator of the emotion or what is going on in the novel. A warm, smooth touch of a hand on yours conveys a much different feeling than a cold, rough one. The fun part is you get to decide what it's all about and why you included that detail. Because if you're going to have detail like that, it needs to enrich either your plot, your characters, their emotions, something in the novel and something else about skin. An ARC reader noted in Goddesses Inc. that I never mention skin color uh, with any of my goddesses. I didn't have to beyond explaining what they were the goddess of, which gives you a pretty good indicator. I had no skin or hair or any other kind of descriptors. You know, they're all beautiful, they're goddesses. So there's that. The reason I didn't actually go into great depth and detail about, you know, hues and shades and all of that is because I live and work in a very ethnically and culturally diverse area. And so for me, I couldn't assign a descriptor to explain a culture or ethnicity or a race in terms of a physical descriptor. Didn't feel authentic to me. Didn't feel realistic. 
Now, I digressed a little, but this second draft is where I will find plot flaws and see a lack of flow. So I keep a sharp eye out for that. This is where I may get to chapter 25 and realize that I needed to do some kind of setup or foreshadowing in chapter 10. Then I go back to chapter 10 and add it in, even if it's only a line or two or something that when I come back around to the revision number three, that it's going to say, oh yeah, I need to add this in or change this conversation or tweak this conversation. Also in my second draft, I will switch chapters around or add a new chapter. This is also where I try to create a hook at the end of each chapter so that you are compelled or feel like you want to read the next chapter. What happened? If I don't, it's okay because I still have some more revisions to do, but I give it my best shot. This is also where I focus and look at the overall tone of the novel, my voice as it were, because my urban fantasy reads much, much differently than my historical fiction, as well it should. I will also look at the pacing of the sentences. My different genres require different kinds of pacing, a different kind of feel, and that's where our, this is where I really start kind of bringing it all in and really feeling the novel as a reader would, or as I want the reader to feel it. I don't reread the chapters as I'm working through it, unless I need to find something to tweak something, then I will go back and take a look at it. That often happens, but I don't reread all my chapters because I would be spending all my time rereading instead of moving ahead. And I'm still have more revisions to go. But by the end of the second draft, I feel really, really good about my novel. It is made real to me. My characters feel real to me. The story is working. I've smoothed out all of the rough spots. My vision for the novel and my imaginings are now real. And that makes me super happy and eager to start the third draft. I always breathe a big sigh of relief and normally have a little celebration after I write my second draft. It is a big, big deal for me. I know the novel is almost done. Now I just need to tweak and fine tune. And although I smoothed out a lot of that rough draft, you know what it needs next? It needs to be polished. And that's what I do in my next couple drafts. And we're going to have a video about that too. I hope you join me next week when I'm going to actually discuss queries, how to write them, what to put in them and what not to put in them. Because that is the biggest problem I see is putting too much in them. If you haven't already, I would love if you would hit that subscribe and notify button, get me out there on the YouTube verse. And as always writers, dream, create and embrace. Bye-bye.